Well, when I went to Pork Fest this year, I got the chance to meet uh, Boston Tea Party, who is one of my favorite authors, and I highly, highly recommend that people check out his books, especially his uh, Boston's Gun Bible, Hologram of Liberty, uh, and uh, One Nation Under Surveillance, which is really a compilation of several of his other books, and also one called You and the Police. And he has a great novel also called Molan Labe. And he is a, a pretty interesting synthesis of uh, hardcore, refined libertarianism, uh, scholarly historian, and a, uh, a, a basically a badass, rugged individualist um, marksman slash judo expert, whatever. And I first heard about him years ago, and I read a number of his books, and then I kind of put it in the back of my mind, and uh, seeing him at Parkfest and talking to him and, and uh, rereading some of his books, which are as entertaining as they are informative, and they're very much of both. Uh, it got me thinking about the options for an individual libertarian. And uh, I don't claim that these are the only options, but in broad categories, I think when you look at the dialogue libertarians have and what they talk about, I think we have the op people see on the table they have three options. They can fight, they can fight, flight, or hide, to use a real common phrase amended slightly. Um, and all these uh, actions have pros and cons, and uh, I thought I would weigh some of them. Now, the flight one, this is the idea that if things are really bad, you should leave. And I, when I say that, I, I, I don't specifically mean just Americans in the United States. I mean anybody, anywhere. And there's lots of pros to this. Um, firstly, everyone's an individual, and so everybody has their own um, personal valuations of when this makes sense and when this doesn't. So uh, most libertarians might be perfectly happy in a society and yet it might be one where for whatever reason you cannot stand it. Um, just hypothetically, what if maybe there were libertarian seascapes, you lived down there, but it turned out you were um, so uh, susceptible to maybe seasickness or paranoia or phobias about the ocean, or maybe your work didn't even, you didn't have any useful skills or anything, it might make sense for you to leave. Likewise, even if you're like me and you think that on net the United States is one of the best places to be, there might be specific reasons in your case why that's not so, and that someplace else might be better. Uh, and each individual has to make that decision for themselves. I don't think that it's right to categorically say people who are doing that are cowards or jumping ship because we don't you know you can't say if you think you have a if you think that your life is in danger or your property is severely threatened or your way of life is threatened and you feel that escape would alleviate that to some degree then you're totally justified in doing it uh, but there are a couple problems I see with this practically speaking the biggest proponents I know about this tend to be in extraordinary circumstances. Namely, they tend to be rich. And of course, there's nothing wrong with being rich, and there's nothing wrong with using your wealth to give yourself more freedom. But probably the most famous exponent of this would be someone like Doug Casey, who I always knew was wealthy. Very recently, I've heard people reference him as being much more wealthy than I even imagined. I heard on a podcast somebody who didn't sound very speculative that he is a near billionaire. I don't know if that's really true, but he's definitely a millionaire of some type or another. Uh, the other person who's uh, well known for this is Jeff Berwick of the Dollar Vigilante, who I had watched on YouTube for years, and I got to, a chance to see him give a lecture at Porkfest. And basically his strategy, it's basically find all the loopholes and then bribe your way through whatever government. And so he's from Canada, which right off the bat makes it easier for him because the Canadian government is less draconian treating his expats than the American government is. He basically has his citizenship in the Dominican Republic and the point there was in the Dominican Republic if you make money in the Dominican Republic you get taxed for it 
But if you're a citizen of the Dominican Republic and you make your money someplace else, say you work in Guatemala, for instance, you don't get taxed for it. And then the other trick was to find a country that if you're not a citizen, it doesn't matter the money that you make there, it's not taxed. So Jeff Berwick lives in Acapulco, Mexico, because the Mexican government doesn't tax the income of non-citizens. And the Dominican Republic, where he is a citizen, doesn't tax the income of citizens who make their money abroad. So he doesn't pay any income taxes, although he'll still pay property taxes on whatever else, sales taxes. Um, and that's basically how he goes about it. But then he also talks about how when he tries to run businesses and regulators come and try and stop him, he basically just bribes them. If he gets into any trouble, he basically just bribes them. So his five-step program really has an initial first step, and that is to be very wealthy. He was able to expedite receiving citizenship in these countries uh, and permits to work in these countries because he had lots of money. Uh, apparently he lost a huge fortune, but he still ended up being pretty wealthy. So when I hear people like Doug Casey say diversify politically, uh, that is easier said than done. Money really does make that easier. And I don't say that in a contemptuous way to those who have money or those who want to earn it. Um, but it's it doesn't do a, most people a lot of good. I mean, I, I remember in a slightly different scenario, just when I was in college, you know, I really wanted to invest in gold and silver, but at the time, it just, I mean, how many times do you hear people say, well, put 20% of your wealth in the gold and silver, and you're not even, I mean, I was barely making ends meet and saddled with a whole bunch of debt. The idea that I would get heavily into gold and silver was kind of like a cruel jape, uh, but eventually it may be it's something to look at. Um, I do think it makes sense to the extent that it's possible for you to cultivate um, possible alternatives politically. I, Doug Casey, uh, I think I heard him say once, it makes sense to diversify your portfolio and it makes sense to diversify your polity. You know, if you have other places you can go, that's good. And it doesn't always require a lot of money. Money expedites it, but there's other ways you can do so. Uh, I have a couple places that I've kind of looked into and that I've taken tentative steps towards um, cultivating potential uh, living arrangements. I haven't gone very far in that way, but I think that's not a bad idea. It's always nice to have a lifeboat if you can or to work towards having one. So there's that. But one, one criticism, though, I do have is at the end of the day, that is never going to be a long-term solution. So fleeing from oppressive government will never eliminate oppressive government. If we don't have a place that we can um, be able to prosper, not just as as a individual who is super adept at escaping, but within a, a broader societal context, then we're, we'll never see reform. And you're also just waiting for the day that whatever loopholes you're using are closed. Now that doesn't mean you couldn't still find a way. Um, the regulators are never going to be as fast as the most adept anti-regulators, but I don't think it's a long-term solution. I, Boston Tea Party says no matter how good the net, there's always going to be some minnows that are going to be just a little bit too fast. But that doesn't mean they won't catch the most of the rest of us. Uh, Berwick is in, always in danger that the Dominican Republic or Mexico will change its policy or that Canada changes its policy, or whoever else. Uh, I know in the case of the United States, they are demonstrating a willingness and an ability to strong arm, strong arm other govern governments into uh, basically extorting U.S. expats, or even people who are not expats, but the government thinks might be expats. In fact, apparently this Facebook Eduardo Saverin uh, thing, uh, the government is now basically saying any American who wants to expatriate, the reason they are doing that is because of tax evasion. I'm sure that is the reason for a lot of them, although it's not evasion to keep your own money. But uh, they are basically making it a crime. They, or they, they wish to consider it as such. And their wishes tend to pan out eventually, at least to some extent, in the judiciary. So uh, it's not a long-term solution, but it might be right for any given person. Uh, now, another related one is not to necessarily the country, but is to hide. And if you read Boston Tea Party's books, uh, he has enormous, like, uh, 
his first book he wrote was called Bulletproof Pri Privacy, but he wrote a much more recent one, I think a year ago, called One Nation Under Surveillance, which, uh, reading it, uh, I recognize the large sections of it are lifted straight out of Bulletproof Privacy, but it's much expanded, so that's probably a better one to get. Um, basically, the idea is that you should have... Um, you should basically hide your entire life. Like, if the government goes to look for you, they're not going to find you. They're going to find a gravestone or a headstone or an empty apartment or a post office box, but they're not going to find you. And the money you make and the expenses you entail, none of that's tied to your name and none of that's tied to where you live. And, and no, no two pieces of evidence about your existence tied to each other and lead to you and uh, basically you shouldn't let anybody know except your very like your friends and family and even then only partially where you're living what you're doing you shouldn't tell anybody that you own guns you shouldn't tell anybody that you own gold you shouldn't tell anybody where you live you should encrypt everything you should have uh, I mean his passwords he was saying that you should make your passwords to the maximum uh, degree of bit whatever basically that they should be 90 characters long using not just letters and numbers but all the other keys on the keyboard uh, that they should be randomized that you should encode everything uh, that you shouldn't use the post office except in a way that can never lead back to you that you should I mean just the amount of privacy that he advocates is is mind-boggling now what he's and and he's honest like okay if someone really 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 wants to find you there's nothing you can do to make that impossible it's there is no way to have a hundred percent security however you can make it so that it's not worth their time so if they just want to question you about a tax return from five years ago you can make it so hard to find you that they'll never even bother looking on the other hand achieving that level of secrecy is very difficult although not impossible it it basically does require though that you have a job that you can't just get a job at a retail place or whatever where you're getting paychecks uh, that sort of thing um, because that's it's either gonna lead to you or to your alias assuming you have a fake ID and all that so uh, I think that this is a good idea that people should do this to some extent at least. You should have uh, assets at least hidden, you should have places that are safe, you should have um, you should have it so that not everything about you is that easy to find. And I think that it is plausible for most people to get at least a degree of this. Uh, doing things like having your computer be encoded, that's something that's pretty basic and that I think anybody would be able to do if they put forth a little time and a little effort. Uh, the other stuff, I mean, getting numerous fake IDs and having basically numerous, uh, multiple uh, identities that you kind of juggle around, that's hard. It makes sense, I guess, to an extent. But my main issue here is that by, by being so secretive about your life and uh, around others, around strangers especially, that you are hurting another element of this, which would be the fight. Now, when I say fight, it doesn't necessarily mean physical revolution, although it would include that, but I mean agitating for and working for a society that you want and against developments in society that you oppose. And this is where I kind of differ from Boston Tea Party, because I think that the the, the bulletproof security idea um, hinders the latter effort. The, the security idea is wonderful and it's good and people should do it, but it's not actually a solution to our societal problems in and of itself. And I think it also, at least mostly, I, I guess an argument can be made that if everybody had that kind of privacy, then the state would wither away. Uh, that's true. Or not, if, not even everybody, but if enough people had it, that it was impossible to manage the economy or manage society to the degree that states need to manage it to exist. I guess an argument can be made for that. But I think that you are hurting the evangelism, evangelism uh, element that is so crucial to a libertarian movement. Um, one thing, I mean, Boston's big about guns, and he always talks about what kinds you should have, how many, 
But then he always says you should never tell anybody that you own any that are you know strangers. And I really object to this. I think that it makes a lot of sense to articulate why gun ownership is good, why it's not criminal, why it's useful, why it shouldn't be impeded, and influence people who don't already agree with you to that extent. And if you, I mean, he even says you should, even if you don't admit you have guns, you shouldn't become an overtly act, you know, like if you're at work, you shouldn't be telling people how much we need the Second Amendment and how much we need the right to own guns and all that. I totally disagree with that. Now, his reasoning is pretty sound. He thinks someday there's going to be confiscation, or at least there might be confiscation, and they're going to have a hotline, and all your friends from work are going to call and say, hey, I know somebody who has a whole bunch of guns. That is a that is a danger. That is a threat. But by not reaching out to people with the uh, example of your, of your own self, I mean, it's one thing to say gun rights are great, and then say, but I don't own any. I really don't take it that seriously. That's not near as persuasive saying I own a whole bunch and I've never hurt anybody or killed anybody or committed a crime so it shouldn't really be a big issue um, and that's just one example but the things that you should be careful about would be like the gold standard the Federal Reserve basically anything dealing with rights or even strong minarchist doctrine or really even mild minarchist doctrine at this point you know all that stuff is potentially stuff that would red flag you in some kind of totalitarian uh, Gestapo police state, which of course is something that we already have to an extent, but presumably we could have it get a lot worse. Uh, but if that happens, I think our best defense is to have as many people ideologically supporting us as we possibly can. And that means that we can't become recluses. We can't become phantoms that don't exist, um, that, 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 that are just uh, individuals in society who move about without making any waves. I think that we should be outspoken and not just outspoken but articulate and persuasive and and have you know demonstrate through good example you know what we want and so I mean it's not good if if exemplars of libertarianism are just you know unemployed people who live in their basement just students uh, I mean, that's great. Some people have to be students at some point, so that's not per se a problem. But, I mean, we want professional people, successful people, to some degree at least, who are able to, to expound these ideas. We want people to go to rallies. We want people to get out and, and, and to speak up. Not speaking up is very, very dangerous. I mean... If we look back at Soviet times, lots of people thought, I'm not going to say anything. And in the end, no matter how much secrecy you have, that isn't really a defense. That is, since that not speaking up um, incentivizes or at least there reduces the disincentive to those who aggress against us. If they think that there's enough people out there who oppose their program, then there's a good chance that they will alter their program. Maybe they'll make it a longer term thing. Maybe they'll abort it. Maybe they'll amend it. If nobody says anything, then it's full steam ahead as far as they're concerned. So I have, I disagree with Boston Tea Party in that sense. Now, that means still it's a personal call and people should do whatever they can to the extent possible to insulate themselves from the surveillance state, which is, it's growing quite alarmingly. Um, I mean, technology, it, 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 this is one of those areas where it definitely gives the impression that technology aids the state more than society. Now, I, I think technology is a, a double-edged sword. I don't think it necessarily uh, benefits the state uh, to the exclusion of everybody else or more so, but it certainly seems that way a lot of the time. Uh, but that's kind of my take on it. I think that you should cultivate alternative political arrangements, you should cultivate personal security, but to um, become a chameleon and not an activist is basically condemning society and very likely yourself to uh, letting things unfold in a way that you, I mean, we should create the future. And if we hide, then we are, we're not 
you're still having an effect on society when you do that, but it's it's very much diminished. And I think that we should amplify our effect on society as much as possible, even if that does entail some risk. But it's it's every up to every individual to decide how much risk and how much amplification they're comfortable with. So uh, that's pretty much it. Anyone have any thoughts about pros cons? Either way, leave a comment, and uh, that's it.